A new season has brought us a familiar winner in Sakia, but there has been a big shake-up in the order to start the F1 season in 2023. Welcome back to episode number 262 of Grid Talk. Today we're going to be here to discuss the season opening 2023 Bahrain Grand Prix. My name is George Houston, and joining me today we have Grid Talk and Monkey Seat host Tom Horrocks. Hello. Phil Matthew from the Grip Strip Podcast. Hello. And Aaron Harper from AHGP. How are we, chaps and ladies? Very well, very well, thank you. Other than the result for for a good portion of our uh, teams here on the um on the on the on the panel, but I will uh, yeah we'll we'll get into that. Uh, before I do that, uh, I'm just going to mention that if you enjoy this podcast, we'd really appreciate it if you can take five to leave us a five star rating on either Spotify or Apple Podcasts. That would really mean a lot to us. Uh, and if you're one of the seventy two percent of people who aren't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, please head over to Grid Talk on youtube give us a like uh, on on this show give us a subscribe for the channel and also don't forget to ring the bell icon either because then you'll be notified when the uh, when the show goes out live like today's show is going out live we're going out about an hour or so after the bahrain grand prix is concluded today uh so yeah so i mentioned in our intro that um that max verstappen uh won this race it has continued his form really from last year Phil, it was a very dominant performance by the Dutchman today. He was absolutely untouchable, really. I mean, the closest anybody really got to him was Charles Leclerc in the first corner. But besides that, he was not challenged today. He won over by over 10 seconds in the end. Yeah, just more of the same. And uh, it's a concern for everybody else on the grid that is thinking they might have a chance to contend this year for the World Championship, unfortunately. Uh, Max Verstappen and Red Bull have not lost anything. So uh, he really had no challenge uh, other than, as you mentioned, Leclerc. But every lap he'd gain seven or eight tenths, and he had a seven-plus second lead after 11 laps, and that was basically it. Once the pit stop started, uh, he was able to dictate whatever he needed to do. Checo eventually gets back up in front due to something we'll mention later. And um, that was the end of it. There really wasn't much of a challenge. Uh, I don't really see much of a challenge, at least uh, for this race. I knew it wasn't going to happen this race or probably at Saudi. I figured any type of real changes would start in Australia, and I was proven right today. But uh, good job by them. Uh kind of following up what they did uh, last the last couple of years, really. Now he's won at Bahrain and uh, going to Saudi where he won last year after having a DNF in this race, in this race last year. Yeah, it really is the perfect start for Red Bull. I mean, obviously they had a very slow start to the season. Uh, last season they had a quick car, but an unreliable car. Uh, and today it was incredibly reliable and quick, just like they ended the 2022 season. It's quite ominous for the rest of the drivers. Um, and obviously very early stages, uh, Aaron, but you know, uh, going, going off of the gap that uh, the Red Bulls had to the rest of the field, it's, you know, you're thinking that the only person that can really challenge Max Verstappen on a day-to-day basis would be his teammate, Checo Perez. Uh, Sergio today, I think he did a good job, came home second. He did not really challenge um didn't really challenge Verstappen, but I don't think anybody could have done that today. And obviously, maybe Leclerc was having some problems at that stage, but he'd put in a good move on Charles Leclerc and got some good distance on him after losing out at the start. Yeah, I mean, Checo did the job that he is paid to do by Red Bull, which was finish second to Max Verstappen and make sure Red Bull collect as many points as possible. The only point they missed out on this weekend was the one for fastest lap. So all in all, Checo did a perfect job for what Red Bull require him to do. Ultimately, though, I don't see him challenging Verstappen throughout the season. That car is now being tailored to Max Verstappen's uh, every need and wish, and Checo will just have to put up with it, unfortunately, because that's the way teams uh, operate. They build the car around the fastest driver to make sure that it's as fast as it can be and it's driven to its full capacity and gets the best result possible. So Verstappen... Any challenge to Verstappen will come from outside of Red Bull, but that challenge at the moment doesn't seem forthcoming. The pace advantage they had, as Phil mentioned, Verstappen eight-tenths of a second regularly in the opening stages, faster than anybody else on the track. 
Um, it would have been interesting to see how uh, Alonso would have fared in clear air to begin with if he hadn't had to fight through the Mercedes and the Ferraris. Maybe he could have put on a bit of a challenge, but I just think the Red Bull is so well finely tuned that any challenge from anyone that's that's going to be very, very difficult. And it, it looks very ominous. It, it might sound a bit dramatic and a bit doom and gloom, but for Stappen, it almost looks inevitable already. I mean, it feels a bit like the Sebastian Vettel days at Red Bull where he was untouchable at times. And of course, the Mercedes, Lewis Hamilton dominance. OK, there was a bit more friction between teammates, especially 2014 to 2016, but it does look very ominous uh, for everybody else. But if you're a Max Verstappen fan, happy days. <laughs> yeah, the the Iranian army will be uh, celebrating long into the night in Bahrain. They look thrilled with that win, and so they should do. It's looking very good for uh, their man and their team, obviously. Um, um, and we gave a we gave a mention to uh, Aaron. Just gave a mention to Fernando Alonso. There, he managed to get a podium on his debut for Aston Martin. Now, we did uh, we did think about this. Um, you know, we did think that Aston Martin were going to be up there after testing, but you know, we still kind of doubted it because it was a big jump for them. But Tom, how good were they today? Because, like, like Aaron mentioned, obviously, if Nano Alonso had to fight through the pack and he still managed to get third, he passed the Mercedes out on track, he passed the Ferrari out on track. There's a genuine case to be made to say that the Aston Martin is the second fastest car on the grid at the moment. Yeah, you plan this because you know how much I love Aston Martin, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> And if my maths is correct, I'm going to be getting uh, Mr. Stroll as well. So, uh, no, they've they've absolutely done an amazing job. And just to think, like, the eight times Constructors' champions have been outdeveloped by the plucky team that, you know, that isn't going to hit its potential until they get the wind tunnel and factory online, which isn't happening, you know, it's not going to affect any cars until 2025, realistically, majorly anyway. And they've got more wind tunnel time than anyone around them as well, certainly for the first part of the season anyway, until they get the, the next ATR restriction period comes in, they're going to have more wind tunnel time than anyone around them. So they can really make hay while the sun shines at the start of the season and just really get the potential out of this car. Uh, but the thing is as well, you say it could have been so different. You hit by his team out on lap one, that could easily have been incredibly, incredibly embarrassing. Double DNF on the first corner. Um, kept trying to get him a penalty without even knowing that it was him that gave him the uh, collision. But uh, yeah, he even lost out to Bottas on the first stops when Bottas stopped early, um, converting to a three-stopper. So he had to go get past Bottas on track. And there was that comms issue as well in the final stint. I'm absolutely certain that with Hamilton making the, the earlier stop, which I'm sure we'll come on to later, that he was just going to go long, classic Hamilton strategy, go long, switch to the um, to either softs or the mediums, and then and then go in hard on Hamilton right at the end and um, close in on Hamilton and Sainz. But comms issue, it seems like they told him to stay out. He came in and they said, why, did, why, did, why didn't we stay out? Why did I come in? So there's obviously some kind of comms issue in there. So with, with all that in mind, he still had to go on and pass Hamilton, still had to pass Carlos Sainz to get that podium. It's just, it's a phenomenal, it's a phenomenal result, to be honest. And it's been well over a year. We, he's only been on the podium once since, I believe, since his Ferrari days, which was Qatar 21. Mm. So it's, it's a long time coming. And I'm, you know, I, I've been a big critic of Alonso, but I have to say that, you know, I, I said the same last year, uh, completely converted me. I wouldn't go as far as to say I'm a Fernando Alonso fan now, but I was certainly got a lot more respect for his ability, which a certain Spanish person who comes on my podcast quite a lot is going to not let me forget about. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's a huge result for Aston Martin. You know, even when they were showing that pace and testing, we truthfully, I didn't believe it. I didn't think they'd quite be, you know, be quite up there. Um, I thought that, you know, maybe a podium would be on for, for actually, to, you know, to get it in his, in his first race for the team is huge. And for a guy that is infamous for making bad career decisions and moving to the wrong team at the wrong time, he's pulled off a blinder here. You compare where Aston Martin are compared to Alpine, he's 100% improved his position. But it's only one race. Let's see how they go through the season. But obviously, yeah, they have a lot of wind tunnel time. In theory, they have more opportunity to improve the car than, than Red Bull and Ferrari and Mercedes, even more than the likes of Alpine and McLaren because of where they finished last year. Um, but yeah, let's move on to uh, let's move on to the first driver off the podium. Uh, uh, a guy that idolizes, or at least idolized, uh, Fernando Alonso when he was growing up, Carlos Sainz Jr. Um, I mean, Phil, it's kind of a hard one to read, really. I mean, he finished the race, which is more than, uh, you know, more than Charles Leclerc managed because of the mechanical issues of his car. 
But will Ferrari be disappointed with their lack of pace because Hamilton was on Carlos Sainz in the closing stages and Fernando Alonso passed him with relative ease and then pulled out a big gap? Yeah, I think for Ferrari, it's kind of more the same from last year. They have, they wonder what could have been or what could be. And now you add Fred Alonso with a car um, that he can actually drive. Um, and he's not complaining about it, at least for now. And then um, and you're going to go and they're now they're that wild card player. Now you have Mercedes who said that they completely whiffed again, which is, I think, three years, two and a half years, in a, three years in a row that they've whiffed with their cars, if not longer, if we're going to be really honest, but it was covered up. Um, both of those teams are going to continue to progress. So what is Ferrari's answer to that? Yes, Carlos Sainz is the more consistent of the two drivers. He's the one that's more likely to finish. The fact that he got a finish and got fourth place is good to at least give them some uh, some uh, points to start the year. Uh, he qualified well. Um, in the grand scheme of things, yeah, they looking at pace, they could be the second. They, it, but right now, probably they're tied for second with Aston Martin, and there's a good chance that within a few rounds they could fall all the way back to fourth. Um, the the reliability problems that Charles Leclerc had prior to the race starting and some of the power unit components having to be replaced is not a good sign for any of these Ferrari teams, to be fair. But um, at least for Carlos, he got through this race, got a top five out of it, essentially what they were going to, probably the best they could get um, after what happened to Charles. Yeah, uh, with the pace of the car, I think that's that's the most that Carlos Sainz could have really done with his race today. Um, you know, 12 points on the board, it, it's something. They would have been hoping for more, but I think realistically Ferrari were kind of playing down their, their hopes of a good result this weekend, um, and it's justified really going off of that. But they're in the mix at least, which is something. Um, similar to Mercedes as well, Aaron. I mean, I think, uh, I think again, they're another team that were really playing down their expectations coming into this race, and... Uh, fifth place for Sir Lewis Hamilton. Again, that's that's probably the most he could have hoped for today. He maybe could have passed signs in the closing stages, but beyond that, that's that's realistically where the car is. Yeah, maybe maybe he could have got signs, but I think the the Mercedes just doesn't have the the traction. They they were talking about the rear end stability um, being an issue over the weekend, and then obviously the way to counteract that. Is to put more wing on the car, so maybe the, the the straight line speed of the Mercedes wasn't what it could have been potentially. I don't know which wing they ran with in the end because they were trialing as late as FP three uh, a low downforce versus high downforce wing between the two drivers. But for Lewis, that was a a really good drive. I think he showed that he still got the wheel to wheel battle. That little sneaky move uh, on Alonso, where Alonso got a little bit excited on the exit of turn four shows he's still got the nows. He's still got the smell for the overtake, especially like the lap one move he pulled on Fernando as well. So I, I can't get enough of those two battling on the track. I think when you put them on, on the track together, it's just always a recipe for fun, exciting racing. They're, they're not silly enough to start pushing each other off the track. They know just about where the limit is. So they're never going to really come to grief, but it's always good to watch. Lots of fun. Um, the move that Alonso pulled on on Hamilton was a brilliant move. I don't think he had much defence there. And I think, like you say, P5 was about the best Mercedes could have hoped for because if it wasn't an Aston Martin ahead of them, it was going to be Ferrari. And worst case, it was both of them. Um, well, maybe not Stroll. I mean, he's coming back from injury and I don't think he's that top echelon of driver, but yeah, to be beaten by Aston Martin is a real kick in the teeth for Mercedes. And they've admitted that this might not be the right philosophy. So, but I must I must sort of caveat what they're saying there and put it into context. At the launch, they mentioned about a potential new side pod update. So should we be surprised that Toto Wolf is saying, yeah, this isn't the right thing to do? And it's also it all seems down in the dumps. 
for Mercedes at the moment, but they've been saying this for a few weeks now. There's a new update coming in. So I think they found something, a philosophy, a way of developing this car, an angle of approach to, to get more out of it. And it's coming and they're just trying to make the most of what they've got at the moment because they already knew it wasn't going to be good enough. And they're saying, oh, yeah, we know it's not going to be good enough. That's what they're doing now, I think. It's sort of uh, deflection and smokescreen. And then, you know, if they turn up with a B-spec car in like Imola and they're on pace with the Red Bull, I mean, <laughs> who knows what what's going to come in the, the cost cap um checks later on down the line but that that's a whole nother story that, that's a, a whole big conspiracy theory and i won't go down that rabbit hole here <laughs> yeah let's let's not do that let's let's wait for the official facts and figures to come out from uh from the teams before making those kinds of assumptions um but yeah like, like we said there it's the best they really could have hoped for i mean hamilton and russell almost a second a lap uh off of max verstappen's pace over the over the whole race 50 50 odd seconds for both of them off the leader in the end um but yeah, uh, it, it was amazing to see Alonso and, and Hamilton battle like they did. When, when Alonso was closing in on Hamilton, I was thinking, oh, here we go again. This is it. And, and it, so it proved it was really entertaining to watch them two go at it. I mean, yeah, they have a combined age, I think, of 79. Um, you know, so the fact they're still doing what they're doing at their age when most drivers, the vast majority of drivers have retired because they think, you know what, 200 miles an hour is actually pretty fast. You know, these guys are still going at it and it's it's, it's brilliant to see. It really is. Um, and let's, let's give a mention to someone who we have in the past uh not been very complimentary about to say the least but you know what today i'm gonna i'm gonna give him kudos for today because the fact that uh lance stroll today is finished in sixth place uh beating george russell out on track yes admittedly i think the aston is a better car than the mercedes you should expect that but he had surgery like a week ago two weeks ago you know he's got a broken wrist and i think like his shoulder his elbow is, is injured as well and the fact that he's gone out there and got sixth place today tom i think Fair play, you know, that's one of his better drives. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we we, we need to kind of temper expectation a little bit in, in that we don't know what happened with Lance Stroll. They they're very cagey. He he could have you know, he could have just landed on his wrist and been like a bit ah. But you know, he wouldn't have missed all of testing for for, for a minor kind of uh, strain or something like that. So it's clearly serious and it, they take to get to the last minute to put him in the car. We don't know like what's happened but the rumor is he's got steel plates in there or rods or something holding it all together and if that's the case then absolutely he deserves a hero's welcome but uh but yeah he was clearly in discomfort and to to think that qualifying in in eighth place to then i think it was eighth place he qualified uh yes and then to to not only you know maintain that position given the physical pain he was more than likely in to then move forward and move ahead of George Russell as well. You know, he, he gained two positions, one of which was due to the Ferrari dropping off, which we'll talk about later. But but to still, you know, to race competitively and to get ahead of George Russell and then be just behind Lewis Hamilton, um, just four or five seconds away from him at the end there and catching him, I think it's a, it is a solid result. Aside from, you know, using his teammate as a break on turn one, uh, there was a, a very good a very good performance from him. And, um, you know, that, that's, um, that racing with, with George was great as well good undercut and then getting past him on the slightly warmer tires as well uh on um t- to take to take p6 from george russell was um was good and yeah I, like you say he he definitely did not have the pace of fernando alonso but do we expect that really i mean he's he's what well, he's less than 20 seconds off him i know alonso was very much in in uh, management mode once he got past uh, once he got past and away from carlos Sainz. but but still he's given what he's been through and what his overall seeing is anyway that is a a solid result um and he did some good racing with with other other drivers as well when they're on the same part of the track as him so yeah for me not a driver of the day performance spoiler alert but certainly deserves a special mention for what he went through and for what he managed to pull off with the machinery he had as well so yeah solid solid result for Lance Stroll not uh, not his best result on this track he did get a podium but that was a slightly different layout in Sakir but uh, I think he'd still be very happy with that absolutely yeah I think I think if it wasn't for you know hitting his teammate on the first lap that could have ended in disaster for both of them I think he would be in contention personally for me for driver of the day just because of obviously the injury that he's got but yeah uh 
hitting Alonso on the first lap. I couldn't believe that. I was like, what have you done here? Um, you know, it's never easy on the first lap, cold brake, cold tyres, but it looked to me like he just missed his braking point by about 20 metres. And uh, yeah, if it went for Alonso, he would have gone even deeper into that corner, just trying to defend from George Russell. Um, but there we go. Definitely better for him for sure. Just, uh, yeah, we'll see how he gets on in Saudi uh, in two weeks' time. And yeah, we gave a mention to George Russell there, Phil. Uh, seventh place for him today. I mean, perhaps a little bit disappointing. Um, I mean, only five seconds or so off of um, off of Lewis Hamilton. But at the same time, maybe not his best day today. But again, the car doesn't look the easiest to drive in around a track where traction is so key. Uh, you know, that problem with the Mercedes is really going to hurt him hard. Yeah, it's, it kind of goes with how I felt uh, when... Uh... We did the hit for the preview and race preview. George was the better driver relative for the season last year. But this year, I figured that Lewis was going to be back and more motivated and understanding that they are behind and in turn kind of doing what he has to do while considering how good he is and the preparation he has to do, which is a world champion level preparation. George, you know, had a lot of great publicity and um, he is the future of Mercedes. One race isn't going to change that. Um, it's a track that he, it, uh, it's a, a track that he has definitely um, been all right at over his time. Uh, but, you know, when you don't have the car, of course, it's not going to be easy. Um, I figure that it goes the same as I would have said if I had Lewis. It's fine, whatever they get, as long as you're getting points. It's similar to last year. As long as you're getting points towards constructors, keeping yourself up there, you're not competing for first in constructors, basically. So you're trying to go for second. You have more points than Ferrari, and you know we'll see what happens with Aston Martin. Uh, but, yeah, unfortunate result today for him, but a fortunate result. He finished. He got points. Cars in one piece, get to go two weeks' time in Saudi, see if he can get a top five there, get back on that track as what he has been for a lot of last year and um, kind of start making progress towards hopefully competing for that world championship for the first time uh, here in 2023. Yeah, absolutely. I'm with you on that one. Um, now... Obviously, last year we had a top three team uh, kind of dominating the championship. This this year, it seems like there's going to be a top four with Aston Martin joining the trio that we already know. So that means that today's best of the rest goes to Valtteri Bottas in eighth place with an Alfa Romeo. I don't know about you, Aaron, but I did not see this coming at all. I did not have much hope in, uh, for Alfa Romeo this, this season, really. But in Valtteri Bottas's hand, at least, you know, it's good result today. Well, this is where Bottas is showing his pedigree as a, a top-level F1 driver. He was made to look a bit rubbish at times by Lewis Hamilton. I mean, that's no disservice to Bottas. You could put any good F1 driver next to one of the super talents. Look at what happened to Rubens Barrichello at Ferrari. He was made to look a bit average on occasions by Schumacher. So we're now seeing the true level of Bottas. He's taking that Alfa Romeo car you can say, into a position where it probably should be. But the expectation level was, we're not quite sure where Alpha are. And there he is, making up four places from where he started to finish eighth and grab solid points to start the season. You know, if, if, if Aston, as you say, are making it a big four, there's potentially two places that score points on offer every weekend if the top four all finish. They didn't all finish today, so Bottas got himself an extra couple of points in, in P8. So he can only do that. So we, we're we seeing the Bottas that we hoped for at Mercedes in terms of taking hold of the situation and leading the situation. But then and obviously when he was at Mercedes, you have Lewis Hamilton. And as I said earlier, the teams build the car around the best driver in the team. And now Bottas is gaining those advantages because he's the lead driver. So we're going to see the best of Bottas that we can at the moment. And I think within himself, he's found almost like that, that comfort zone. He's happy in his personal life. He's growing a moustache. He's having a mullet. You know, he's he's leaning into, you know, the, the fun side of being a Formula One driver. 
And we're seeing a really good version of Valtteri Bottas. I mean, what version are we on now? Like 12? But it, we're seeing the Bottas that we want to see. And it's really good. He did a really good job today. Yeah, absolutely. You know, he's he's shown he's showing that showing that, you know, no disrespect for him, but he can really take a midfield car and make it better. You know, he's one of those drivers. He's not he's not at the level where he can make a, a top car, a championship car by itself. You know, it's um, you know, that that's kind of his level. And he did a fantastic job today, really did. Um it's credit to him because we didn't really see him that much. He just got on with it, you know, and best of the rest is absolutely deserved by him. Um, you know, as someone who's a shout for driver of the day, in my opinion, uh, for today, uh, the guy who finished in ninth place, uh, Pierre Gasly, I believe he started last because of a, a pit lane speeding penalty, something that his teammate copied several times during this race. But thankfully, Gasly steered clear of that, Tom, today and picked up a couple points in his Alpine debut. I think he did a superb job today. Yeah, he did. I think it was his lap time was deleted in Q1, I thought, because he, I think he went, did he go out in Q1? But then his lap time was deleted. So I think that's what it was. But yeah, it's a stark contrast to last year where he qualified 10th and was the first retirement for that horrendous first lap. Um, so yeah, he's uh, he's done the complete opposite this time. Started last and then ended up in the points. So yeah, solid, solid result. He was, uh, it had a slightly odd strategy, I thought. It seemed, seemed a little bit strange. And just the, I'm sure we'll talk about later, the Alpine operationally today was just a bit strange all round. But but um being the first guy to pit at all, you know, completely what well, lap ten, um, slightly slow stop, lost him a couple of places as well. And then but fortunately the VSC came around at the right time and that uh, that certainly made him um get off some El Pain killers for the uh, uh to, to to avoid the uh the the embarrassment of zero points for his new team on their um on their debut. So yeah, solid result for Pierre Gasly there. Um with Esteban Ocon being completely out of the way, that delays my prediction of him getting a race ban after colliding with him for a few races at least. But uh, I'm convinced it's happening. I'm convinced it's coming. You can see you can see that he's 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 very happy in his new team, but he's ultra competitive. And when you're that competitive, especially with someone in your team who is of a similar level to you, uh, I, I think that's gonna that's a very that's the most combustible lineup on the grid. And I include Alonso and Stroll in that. So that's uh, that's that's going to be entertaining to watch for the rest of the year. But great start for Gasly, uh, starting at the back through into the points that's a stark contrast to his teammates so he's going to be happy but Alpine they were making all the right noises in pre-season everyone was impressed with them thought they were going to be the fourth best car because we hadn't really predicted Aston Martin so expectations changed to the fifth best car realistically it looks like they've got the sixth fastest car on the grid at the moment at best which is um yeah not great not great for them so they need to improve they need to get some updates on the car and uh yeah it's either that or they just massively underestimated everyone which wouldn't surprise me but even so but um just gasly aside i think they've got a they've got a solid serial point scorer in pierre gasly and it's not going to be the first time and not going to be the only time this season we're going to talk about him quietly coming home to get some solid points finishes so yeah good job all around from pierre yeah, he's so he's showing the form that he you know he displayed at Alpha Tauri before 2022. I mean, he pulled up some incredible results for that team back in the day as well when they were Toro Rosso two before that. Um, so yeah, good on him. Great great debut for Alpine today for him. Um, great first race of the season as well for for Williams. Phil, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about both of them here, obviously, because Logan Sargent is the first American in Formula One for quite some time. Uh, but Alexander Albon bringing home his Williams in tenth place, just ahead of Yuki Tsunoda, uh, a point for Williams. To start the season, fantastic for them, and I'm sure Logan Sargent would have had his doubters coming into this season, thinking he's not quite ready, that he's only been put in there just to raise the profile of Formula One in the states. But I thought he did a very good job today, 12th place for him, and not that far off his teammate. Yeah, and I for the comparison will always be to your teammate. That's just motorsports in general, but you're giving up a lot of experience and time to Alex Albon. So in general, it's a learning year for him. But he's shown over time in lower formulas and F3 and even last year, you give him time, he's going to figure it out and he's going to be able to perform. Now, is there a big uh, is there a big body of work? No. But in the grand scheme of things, Williams is a team that for all intents and purposes, people are saying they're going to be on the back of the grid for a good part of this season. So for them to be able to get a 10th and a 12th today, and Logan Sargent made a great start in the race. He moved up three or four spots initially, which 
I mean, if you're going to compare him to who was in that car, that generally wasn't happening. He was competing. He was trying to make things happen. He was racing with the likes of Lando Norris, you know, and Yuki Tsunoda, all the all these other guys in that level. I mean, that is a positive sign for Williams in terms of having somebody to support Alex Albon, who last year at times was taking the worst car on the grid and getting points out of it. Um, now that he's healthy again, now that they kind of are free rolling in a lot of ways, who knows what can come with the uh, Williams. I know they wanted more out of qualifying. Uh, I think that Logan wanted to make it out of Q, Q1. Um, he had a chance, but... Al, Albon did for Williams. It's we're going to keep everything very muted in terms of what expectations we have for them. But Hey, for, for what they are and what the real expectations are to get a point out of the first round of the championship is, is good. They're ahead of three teams right now. So it's a, a nice thing to have going into two weeks from now at uh, Saudi, which is a difficult circuit in general. So we'll see how the rookie, um, is able to take that on. Yeah, the uh, the Jeddah Corniche circuit is definitely a baptism by fire for an inex- inexperienced Formula One driver. It's terrifying just to play on the game, let alone in real life. So, although visibility has been improved there slightly for this year, there's, they've changed the profile some of the corners for that. So that'll probably help, but doesn't make it an easy race by any means. Um, let's uh, let's move on to Alpha Tauri next. Uh, Yuki Tsunoda coming home in 11th and Nick DeVries on his Alpha Tauri debut in 14th today. Aaron, I think I think realistically that's probably kind of where we expected him to be. I mean, Tsunoda had a had a decent race today. I thought definitely better than a lot of his races from last year and DeVries, I mean, you know, perhaps a little bit disappointed from him, although he did start in 19th today. Uh, on Yuki Tsunoda, I'm pleased for him because I have a lot of doubts about Yuki Tsunoda. There was a lot of hype uh, when he made the jump from F2 to F1. I think he needed an, another year in Formula 2 to sort of keep refining his skills. And he's he's basically having to learn to swim among sharks at the moment. And he's just about surviving. But if his performances don't pick up, he's going to get eaten this year. And we we don't want to see drivers struggling we've seen it before like the ricardo situation last year was painful for everybody to watch because daniel ricardo is a popular figure and yuki snoda is a popular figure as well that said he's got to deliver and we know that uh helmet marco won't wait to just you know let people find their feet in a red Bull car if you're not performing you will be out he done, he's done a good job today coming through the field, benefited from being on soft tyres towards the end. And that's why Nick DeVries doesn't look so hot at the moment because he kind of got hung out to dry on old hard tyres. And we all know how the story ends if you've got a car on old hard tyres trying to defend against cars on fresher soft tyres. So that was always a slam dunk for, for those. That was how the Williams cars Carl's got ahead of DeVries as well. He was actually running quite well before that. So it's one of those, you win some, you lose some. And with Alpha Tauri, they were unfortunate to miss out on a point. Sonoda finishing just a second behind Albon. So I was pleasantly surprised with their pace because I, I was concerned that they were going to have another difficult season with, uh, with Sonoda, who's got some doubts and a relative rookie in DeVries, especially in Formula One terms. But, you know, happily proven wrong this weekend. But in Sonoda's case, he has gone well at Bahrain in the past, and then his performances have tailed off. For him, it's about getting that performance level as good as it can be and keeping it there, even if the car isn't allowing him to score loads of points or whatever. It's about that performance level for Yuki. And Nick DeVries, it's about building that confidence within the team. Yeah, and uh, certainly the uh, the card, probably, I'd say it looks quicker than last year. They really struggled last year. I think they were ninth in the constructors in the end or something like that. So an awful year last year for Alfa Tauri, but looking slightly better this year. Um, another team that's perhaps looking a little bit better. I mean, not going off for 12 months ago, obviously, where they had an incredible result, but the Haas, the Haas team today, uh, Kevin Magnussen at 13th and uh, Nico Hulkenberg in 15th, despite showing some real pace in qualifying at times. 
Uh, what, what do you chalk this one up to, Tom? Do you think this is a bit of a disappointing one for them or is it kind of what we really saw happening with them? Well, I think uh, Nico Hulkenberg has certainly he's certainly got the memo with regards to losing front wings and opening stints of laps. So he's uh, he's taken after Kevin Magnussen brilliantly there. So yeah, I think I think operationally they were a bit they were a bit flat today. That that was a bizarre strategy to start Kevin Magnussen on on the hard tire. All that was going to do was guarantee that he lost track position to everyone else. And sure enough, he was last by the end of the first lap. I'm pretty sure. Um, certainly, the first time I noticed him, he was last. And it was just trying to trying to come back from that. A bit of a bizarre three stop strategy, which then kind of got rescued a bit by the virtual safety car, allowing him to kind of move forward. But even so, with with all that, the bad strategy, he still seemed to have the legs on Hulkenberg for for race pace and Hulkenberg heroic in qualifying we've seen that before we saw that at Silverstone when he was super stubby super subbing and qualified P3 I think it was so we know that he's got great qualifying pace he's he's a pole position sitter the same as Kevin Magnussen actually but they've both had poles in Brazil so they're obviously quick over one lap but the race pace just wasn't there for Hulkenberg today and the strategy wasn't there for Magnussen I'm absolutely convinced they will score points this year and they just need to sharpen up operationally, I think, because that's the, I think the, the future looks good for, for Haas this year. Maybe not as good as last year, but uh, I certainly think that they can, they can certainly look to try and finish 7th or 8th in the championship. Um, that's definitely, they, they can certainly look to try and consolidate what they did last year. But I think the headline results probably won't be there, but the consistency should be there now that they've uh, lost the... Uh, that lost the point hemorrhager that is now in the Mercedes team. Lucky them. So yeah, Haas. I'm very. Uh, I, I'm optimistic, cautiously optimistic with how I would uh, how I would rate their weekend. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, let's let's go further down the order. Uh, let's mention uh, Zhou Guan Yu next. The uh, the other Alfa Romeo driver. I mean, obviously, I think I, I think he scored points in his debut twelve months ago in Bahrain and. Bit of a bit of a come down from that, Phil, and especially the gap to uh, to his teammate Bottas, who finished in eighth place. I think today is definitely one to forget for him. Definitely uh, not what he wanted. I think he was a lot better earlier in the weekend. I mean, we go back to testing, and he actually set a quick time during one of the sessions. So what happened between two a week, couple of weeks ago and now in mm. reality? but also the notion that his teammate is much more experienced and generally considered better than him. Who knows? Maybe it was just uh, they didn't get the setup right for him. Uh, He wasn't comfortable and whatever. The pit stops didn't work out relative to trying to get ahead of who else he was around. Uh, We'll see what happens this next race in uh, in, uh, Jeddah. And uh, kind of, I think these first three or four races, I mean, I think it's what, three races, and then there's a month break. Mm. It's an assessment period for everybody. And then once they get to Baku is where we kind of, you know, really start seeing where everybody is going to start, what their real, real situation will be for a lot of the teams that aren't Red Bull, because we already know where they're going to be. Yeah, fair enough. Big old gap between um between Australia and Baku rounds three and four, where the Chinese Grand Prix was until it got cancelled. So yeah, there's a long time to think about the opening three rounds of the season, time to reflect and improve. And hopefully, one of those teams that improves are McLaren. Aaron, um, man, I mean, we they had a horrible race here twelve months ago, and obviously they improved quite quickly after that. I'm really hoping that is going to be the case, but. Uh, Lando Norris, the last of the runners, 17th. Oscar Piastri retired. Even Lando Norris had some sort of electrical problem or something through the race that was costing him time. But, you know, uh, as a fellow McLaren fan, I'm hurting with that one today. That was that was really bad. And I think you tipped him to be the disappointment of the season in our um, in our predictions. And seems like you might be right. Yeah, it was a difficult weekend for McLaren. It wasn't for the lack of proper pace because Norris got, uh, was he 11th on the grid or did he get into Q3? He got into Q3, didn't he? P10, I think. He was Um, 11th, but yeah, he wasn't miles off. Okay. Yeah. So he wasn't dramatically off. So the pace is there. Piastri is going to obviously take a little bit of time to settle in and get, get himself up to speed. 
And the problems that they face today weren't, I say weren't car related, they were mechanical issues. So an electrical failure for Piastri where he lost the gears and lost the engine. Uh, the air pressure problem for Norris, which we're kind of seeing more and more often, actually, because it used to be a very once in a blue moon thing. It's now become more of a commonplace thing to see. Um, but yeah, they're not fundamental aerodynamic deficiencies. OK, the, the car itself definitely needs improving. And I do think there's something about the Bahrain circuit that just the way they build their cars, it just isn't compatible. So you, we might go to Jeddah and all of a sudden they're in the hunt for the fringes of the points. And I, I think today without the issues that Norris faced, he would have been somewhere around where Gasly and Albon ended up. Somewhere in that. He might not have got points, but he would have been somewhere in contention for it, I think. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how they pick themselves up from this. They've got an outstanding performer in Lando Norris. So if they get the car right, if they get it sweet, he's going to do the job and a potential superstar in Oscar Piastri. So it's not for the, the lack of driving skill. The car is okay. It's not as bad as it was feared after testing, but things could certainly have gone a lot better today. Yeah, definitely want to forget. And I will hope to do so very quickly. Also, Dave, to forget, for Esteban Ocon, um, he had so many penalties. It's ridiculous, Tom. I mean, try and sum it up. I think he had to have a wing change. He got a penalty for a collision. He got a penalty for not taking a penalty. He got a penalty for speeding the pit lane twice, I believe. Um, I mean, honestly, I think the World Cup final had less penalties. Uh, it was absolutely laughable. Um, just try and sum up his day because absolute nightmare. Yeah, I mean, you've, it's, I've got it all listed here, exactly what happened to it. It was a five-second penalty for, for overshooting his, uh, his, his grid markings. Then he had to have a front wing replacement because the end fence was loose. Then he got, um, he got an additional penalty for not serving the penalty correctly. He's got a five-second penalty, of which I can't remember exactly what that was for. Maybe it was a collision with somebody. Uh, then he got another penalty for speeding in the pit lane and then got an additional penalty for not serving the penalty correctly. Um, and it's just... I mean, I'm, I mentioned El Payne for Gasly. This is El Payne all over. Um, I, I take absolutely... Lots of joy in saying how bad Alpine are doing at the moment, but uh, no, it's it's not good. It's not great at all. They they need to sort this out because this was driver error led to team error, led to team error, led to driver error. It was just a catalogue of mistakes. It was an absolute embarrassment for Alpine, and that's just, it's not good enough. Absolutely not good enough. One half of the garage should be absolutely ashamed, and it's it's the whole team on that side as well. The Gasly side maximize their weekend from from the disappointment of qualifying they did the best they could Ocon did absolutely nothing and it, again it was it was down to him and down to the team neither can blame each other they both just need to go home sort themselves out and pick themselves up and go again because it's yeah I I, I mean I've, there's not much more I can say on that it's just absolutely horrendous so yeah they they really need to pick themselves up and do better because that was bad very bad, really bad, laughably bad. I, I honestly, I was just laughing. I mean, I think, um, I think, I think his race engineer was like, "Yeah, Esteban, we've got, we're going to serve a penalty this pit stop. It's fifteen seconds." <laughs> it's like I just thought it just got worse and worse. And even after all that, he was still ahead of Norris for the most part. So I, I was, I was laughing and crying at the same time at that. Um. And also crying, I think, will be, uh, or at least they probably want to after this race, will be Charles Leclerc, Phil. I mean, the, the warning signs were there. With I think we had an energy store replacement before the race, which is really, really bad before your first race when you have two to last all season. Um, but then he had an engine failure when he was running in third place. Uh, he did all he could. He got to second off the line. He held off Perez for as long as he could. He was the only guy that could mix it with the Red Bulls today. But that is that is some more pain in Bahrain for him. I mean, coming off of uh, winning the race there last year and then uh, <laughs> a year later being in a position to possibly get a podium, only lose a handful of points to Verstappen, 
you go and leave with nothing and two of the power unit components that you can only have two of for whatever reason. It's just stupid. I mean, they run more Grand Prix and they have less components. I don't understand how that makes a lot, any sense, but whatever. Uh, that's F, F1 for you in that sense. But for Leclerc, I mean, he's very, his mood is very, uh, he's, he needs the momentum is all based like if he's feeling very good he looks like a that next big thing or whatever why Ferrari has put so much in him but then when things like this happen you start seeing the downtrodden you see how sad he is and he you he wears it on his sleeve and for Ferrari getting the second row lockout um, was good pace relative to Red Bull wasn't there but overall but they could have gotten a 2-4 out of this deal instead or a 3-4 out of this race. Uh, but now you've got major engine concerns or power unit concerns, whatever, uh, with two of the components. He blows an engine. Uh, I mean, it's, it's about as bad as you can start a season, really. And uh, they got a race in two weeks' time, probably with grid uh, possibility. Well, maybe not grid penalties, but... Uh, that will probably come sooner rather than later anyway, but it's not good when you're trying to compete for a world championship when you're going to be taking grid penalties prior to the summer break, which um, is very likely in the sense of uh, Charlotte Claire. But uh, if I guess if you're going to fall out of a race, falling out of the first one's probably the only good one to do because you got 23 more to go or 22 more to go. So uh, you can only go up from here. Indeed, indeed, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, obviously, the, both Red Bulls retired from the first race of the season last year, and look where they ended up. So there is, there is hope for Ferrari for sure, but um, definitely concerning as well. The amount of engine components he's already used. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so yeah, those are the twenty teams. Uh, sorry, the twenty drivers and the ten teams. We've gone through them all for you. Um, now it's time to pick our driver of the day. Um, now it's a very obvious choice here, understandably, but. I am going to go for someone a bit different. I'm going to go for uh, Fernando Alonso today. I I thought he was brilliant. He did have he did have one mistake where I think he hit into the back of uh, Carlos Sainz while he was trying to pass him. That was very uncharacteristic. But other than that, the guy drove the wheels off his car as you expect and ended up with a podium for Aston for his Aston Martin debut. I don't think you could have really asked much more than that today. Um, Aaron, who's your pick for driver of the day? Uh, I like your shout for Fernando Alonso. I think he kind of made this race, but I'm not going to pick him. I'm going to go for Alex Albon uh, getting Williams off the mark in the first race. I think, oh, when was the last time they got points in the opening round? You may be looking 2017, perhaps, because 18, they had Stroll and Sorokin, so that was pretty unlikely. Uh, yeah, maybe as far back as 2017, if I, memory serves me correctly, and that's just me guessing. So, yeah, top job from Alex Albon. It could have even been double points had there been a bit more attrition up the front. Uh, but yeah, a, a point to kick things off for Williams. Uh, and they're immediately off the bottom of the constructors' table. <laughs> yeah, and let's hope they uh, stay off the bottom of there. I think I know who is at the bottom at the moment, unfortunately, but I'm not going to guess. Um, yeah, very very worthy for that. Yeah, good good point on uh, on the first race of the season for sure for, for Williams to get him off the mark. Tom, who's your pick for driver of the day? Um, I am going to go Fernando Alonso with you as well. Um, I think, I mean, there's not much more we can say about Fernando Alonso's performance. Max Verstappen, yeah, is the other obvious one because of just how dominant he, he was. But, you know, even managing a minor issue as well and still winning by country mile. But, but yeah, Fernando, he, I think what helps with, with with driver of the day is the fact that he also had a bit of adversity to to overcome as well and and he got that car where the car could possibly have got to if it had started in the place he should have started but yeah so that basically that car got to where it absolutely could have got to there's nowhere else it could have gone and uh, and he got it there despite having a couple of mercedes and a couple of uh, a couple of other um uh, roadblocks in the way so no absolutely solid solid performance uh, very very lucky with two collisions not to uh, not to you know not to have any damage so uh, they build them strong at Aston yeah and those Pirelli tyres are pretty strong too on them, on them as it, it turns out I don't know how he didn't get a puncture from Stroll but thank god he didn't because it was a great result for him in the end 
Uh, Phil, who's your pick for driver of the day today? I'll give it a clean sweep for Fred. Uh, I mean, considering his fan base and wanting to see him compete up in the front, it's been a while. Uh, what is it? Uh, Qatar in 2021. So last podium, and he's, I think he started on the front row or the second row in that race, too. Um, I mean, he did qualify on the front row last year in Canada, but uh, for somebody who's as competitive as he is and has the, shown the talent of 32 Grand Prix wins and two world championships in the past, uh, having him up there kind of mixing it up adds a little bit of spice to what generally looks like the status quo up front. So for that, you should uh, give the guy credit and um, we'll see what he brings to the table here as the next couple of races come along here in Jeddah and at uh, uh, Melbourne. Yep, so three for Alonso, one for Alexander Albon, uh, none for Max Verstappen. The guy was absolutely faultless today, but, you know, whoever your driver of the day is, you can tweet us out at Fun Chronicle. You can comment on the live chat as well. Obviously, we are going out live. Let us know who your pick for the, the driver of the day today was. Um but yeah, thank you to my panelists for coming on the, the show today. Uh, Aaron, I've mentioned that you are the man behind AHGP. What is that and uh, where can people find it? Uh, so you can find it on YouTube, on all good podcast platforms. Uh, uh, George, you have been on already this year. Phil, you have already been on as well. Tom, I want you to be on this year as well. So uh, there, there's your, your formal invite. Um, yeah, so I just talk about motorsport basically it's my opinions it's all sorts so we do sort of feature shows where we have conversations about things that are going on so phil you and i spoke about testing and the fia nonsense george you and i had a look at uh the three returning drivers to formula one uh, and there's lots of topics that we can get stuck into throughout the season so i want to cover formula e which i do with my live streams and i want to cover formula two a little bit as well and the junior formula and just anything that happens. Um, yeah, you can find it there. You can find me AHGP pod on Twitter and uh, yeah, you can find me on Instagram as well. AH Grand Prix. Thank you for that. Yeah, no, it's a great show. I've been on a few times now back in the days when it was the five red lights podcast as well. And yeah, Aaron covers some great topics, asked some great questions. He, he asked them kind of questions where you just have to sit there and think, hmm, okay, well, let me think about response here. So that's always a good sign. Uh, Tom, I mentioned that you are the man behind the Fireside series on, on iPhone Chronicle and also uh, one of the co-hosts on the Monkey Seat podcast. Yeah, uh, we've. Uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll be getting some more Fireside podcasts up fairly soon. We'll be chatting to people from in and around Formula One. I had Chris Medland on at the start of the season where he predicted Fernando Alonso would win a race this year. And uh, we said, what? That's crazy, Chris. You're absolutely nutter. So it doesn't seem so silly now, does it? So if you want more input like that, keep an eye on the uh, on, on the Grid Talk channel and you'll you'll see those Fireside episodes. Myself and my good friend Carl, we do a uh, an uncensored podcast called The Monkey Seats, which has been going since uh, since the start of the pandemic um, and uh, coming out of the ashes of Formula One and we, 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 we've we started up again this year and we're we're uh, basically it's just two lads having a laugh about Formula One uh, we don't worry too much about um, about bleeping out swearing or anything like that Carl gets a bit crazy sometimes and goes on rants it's always a good laugh I try and temper his uh, te- temper his uh, <laughs> his moods a little bit but it's it's good fun trying anyway so come and give us a check out uh, monkeyseatpod.com or on the socials at Monkey Seat Pod. Yeah, nobody is safe from the Monkey Seat Podcast, including me. I got targeted recently on the latest show, and Carl very nicely apologised. And I accept your apology, Carl. I really do. I didn't name you. I didn't name you. No, no, but he he, he contacted me after fair play to him, and I actually listened to the show, and I thought, yeah, he is he is indirectly called me out there. But you know what? Fair enough. It was funny. I, I laughed. Um, so, so yeah, uh, Phil, I have mentioned that you are one of the people behind uh, the Grip Strip podcast. What is that and where can people find it? Just like uh, Tom and Carl's show, uh, the Grip Strip podcast came around during uh, at the start of the pandemic. And now we're in year four, season four, episode 159 uh, this coming week. And uh, we cover all things motorsports, the way I say it. As long as it goes fast, we talk about it on the Grip Strip podcast. Myself and uh, Josh Fine, the former iRacing Indy 500 champion, which, of course, it doesn't exist anymore on iRacing. So he'll 
for for perpetuity be an Indy 500 champion in a form in a format that doesn't exist. But um, he tried to win Daytona. Hasn't happened yet. We'll see what else he can do in other forms of motorsports. You can find us on all good um, podcasting platforms. You can also find the show on philipgmatthew.com, my blog site. Um, you can find me at Philip G. Matthew on Twitter and Josh at JP Huffine and uh, his uh, Twitch streams at you sailor too, when he's on iRacing. So um, thanks again, guys. And thanks. Glad to be on for uh, another year, of course, the second time this year. So getting on nice and early, uh, probably going to be sometimes when that ain't going to happen, but i um, glad to be on with everybody here and good job, George, as always uh, hosting the show. So uh, glad to be on with you guys. No, oh, thank you, Phil. It's always a pleasure having you on here, and it's uh, obviously yeah, check out that show as well. It's a it's a lot of fun. It's a very it's a long form podcast. It's different to most of the shows that we do over here, but yeah, they cover so much. It's it's brilliant what they do. Um, and I think this is the first time I'm going to mention this on the on the show. Uh, we do have a new merchandise store. So if you go over to Redbubble and search up for Grid Talk, you can find you can find some. You might the video viewers may have seen some of the mugs and merchandise yet. Um, obviously we we have Grid Talk mugs. We have we have good talk shirts like Phil is very proudly displaying my fan club one. Every host has a fan club shirt, and uh, some people like Phil have uh, have some different ones as well. Like Philip Matthew is my spirit animal, like his mug there just as well. Yeah, um, and there's all there's also notepads on there. There's stickers. There's, there's all sorts of stuff. Definitely go and check that out if you really want to support the show. That's a great way to do it because we get a good amount of the profits for that. So that's a great way to to you know we can feed some money back into the show for some better lights, mics, and recording equipment just like on our patreon as well so search it up on there as well you can become a patron on there uh, and if you have some ideas for merchandise as well by all means dm us give us some suggestions you know we're open to suggestions for this if you can think it up we can probably make it on there so yeah just let us know about that um grid talk is also available on youtube where most of the episodes are recorded live just like this one as well as amazon fire spotify google Podcasts, apple music verbal and pocket cash just search for the formula one grid talk podcast on all of those and you can find our big back catalog of shows over 250 episodes now which is just crazy to think and we're gonna we're gonna top 350 overall by the end of the year i'm sure maybe 400 if we keep going like this um and you can also uh you can also Access us via uh, SkyQ or Sky Glass in the UK, where you can find us via the Sky Sports F1 podcast section. We're still on there, which is amazing to see. Uh, and yeah, I want to thank everybody, thank panelists again for coming on the show. Really much appreciated, lads. Really enjoyed today's show. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Great. Always great being on. And we'll be back in about a week's time to preview the second race of the season, the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. But until then, thank you very much for watching and listening and goodbye. Um, it's good to be back. I've got to shoot, Japs, because uh, my dinner's ready. So uh, I just love you and leave you for the uh, post show. But thanks for having me on. No uh, problem. I'll I'll love to see you, mate. Good to see you too. Take easy, Take care, lads. Mate. Take care, man. Cheers. Yeah, let's. We've got some comments on the live stream, so we'll just go over them. A lot from Jared Bradley, one of our regulars. <laughs> Thank you, mate, for all these comments. Let's try and go. Over. I won't. I don't think we'll be able to go through all of them because I need to shoot off pretty soon as well. But um, I'll just go through some of these. I think Bottas is faster with the mullet. I mean, yes. potentially, <laughs> potentially <laughs> less uh, less hair overall. I think so. Weight saving. The wannabe uh, KK Rosberg look is definitely working. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, the working for Valtteri. Oh, God. I think we can crown Max and Red Bull now. I can't see any other teams making up the gap over a year and getting ahead of them. I, I mean, I can't really disagree with that, unfortunately. Um, but the the beauty of Formula One is even when it's just a you know one one sided championship battle, there are battles further down. I mean, who's going to be second? Is it going to be Ferrari, Mercedes, Aston Martin? You can't call that yet. So there's a lot to fight for. But yeah, the championship looks um, it take a big mess up from Red Bull basically uh, to kind of stop that. Um, Mercedes are going back to the drawing board and Ferrari are going to Ferrari. <laughs> Alonso and Aston Martin are going to steal points from Merck and Ferrari all year. I think that'd be a very close battle between them three, to be honest with you. Um, there's not a lot between them going off and staying, even in Lance Stroll's hands. 
that Aston Martin looks good. It's going to be up there in the points, I think, regularly. It's a very reliable car, it looks like. It's a very smooth car to drive. And people are saying Alonso will get a lot more out of it than Vettel would. I think Vettel would be doing just as well as Alonso in this car yep. because it's exactly the kind of car that Vettel loves. They would have designed this car around Vettel, potentially, uh, because it was quite a late move for Fernando. So uh, I think we would be seeing Alonso, uh, we would be seeing Vettel mm-hmm. fighting for podiums in this car as well. It's a shame he's not, but but there we go. You know, you have to save, save a seat for the sun. Um and but again he will potentially be getting podiums in this car as well so uh yeah that's that's let's see how he does but uh yeah it's it, yeah, they are like you like you said they are the second best car right now and they have a lot of tools at their disposal to be able to make it better as well and i kind of wish that felipe Drogovic could have been in that car because I oh yeah that would have been that, good that would have actually been something a young mm. formula two world champion jumping in that piece and he he had good pace and testing as well so who knows uh he, he's somebody if something were to come up with one of the drivers i think he would be able to plug and play and perform for that organization which is actually a good thing uh it may not be the case for every team with their third driver but i think in the case of stroll f1 they definitely have one that has a lot of hunger and drive and passion so Mm. Yeah, no, I, th- I think a lot of drivers would do well in that car. It seems that, like like Tom said, it seems like a very straightforward and easy car to drive by F1 standards. So yeah, Drogovic, I think, would have been very handy this weekend. But you know, guys, F1 debut, I'm sure I'm sure you'll make it into Formula One eventually. Um, it's it's just tough. It's just really tough, as we've seen it. T- sometimes it takes a very long time, as we've seen with Nick De Vries, but he's there for this season now, and he, you know, he's not going to go anywhere for the meantime, at least. So, so there is that. Um, Jared's also commented on, um, well, he said that Alonso was his driver of the day, which agreed with most of the panellists today. Um, he's also mentioned about a new layout on the live stream. Yeah, we've got a new design for that, and it looks really good. I, It's so professional. I can't remember whether it was our, uh, our producer, Aiden, or someone else who made it, but yeah, very good job by whoever did that. It's, uh, it's a really, really big step up in production quality. Definitely. Um, looks great. Yeah. Uh, let's see. RFP McLaren, slow and unreliable. Uh, you can only be forgiven for one of those. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't disagree there. Uh, but McLaren were very close to breaking a record today. In fact, two records. And they, may have, they, may have, they may have equaled one. I need to double check my facts on this. But they are one pit stop away from the most amount of pit stops ever recorded in a race, which was Alan Prost making seven pit stops in Donington in 1993. Oh, no Landon Norris made six today, but he fitted seven sets of tyres, which I think might be a record because I think Alan Prost <laughs> went back and forth through different tyres. Yep. I don't think they had seven different ones. So I think he's fitted more tyres to his car than anyone else in a Formula One race history. Yeah, he would go and come. In. Oh, that was I love that race for so many reasons. But mm. The whole Alan Pross coming in when they would yell on the radio, "Stay out!" No, I'm coming in. He goes and puts on rain tires. He drives around slow. Okay, I'm coming in for slick tires. And he got passed by Damon Hill, which was great too. Kind yeah, of no problem. Oh no, Damon was his teammate. Was it? In 93. Oh, was, oh, yeah. oh sorry, 93. Yeah, I thought I'm thinking yeah. about it in the Brabham. Yeah. No, if he anybody passed anybody in that Brabham, that would have mm. been something. That car was you when you talk about Fred Alonso and Formula Three engine or Formula Two engine. That car was a disaster. That was the one that uh, had Flavio Briatore, one of Flavio Briatore's girlfriends, in it. that Giovanna Amati or whatever. Oh really? Wow. Yeah. That was the last Brabham, I think, as well in '92, yeah. and it's not a surprise why. Uh, yeah, it was yeah. So freaking ugly. The color scheme was bad too, on top of it being slow. It was pink and blue, wasn't it? Yeah, it was some ugly combination. Like Alpine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they look like they look like uh, what do you call tracing point for the first three rounds, and then they'll go. Yeah. Back to Alpine. Is it three rounds? We got that dog awful car. I think it is. Yeah. I think it's the first three rounds this year. I don't mind if it's all pink, but it's just pink and black, isn't it? Mm. They're just replacing the blue with black. Effectively, yeah, everybody's replacing parts with just bare carbon fiber. Now. Yeah, there's not going to be that much color schemes anymore because everyone's trying to make their car as light as possible. Yeah, I think you knew, especially George, you had to put up my rant on the preseason pod about what I think about the uh, the bare carbon cars. So, 
Uh, yeah, can't disagree with you though. I really can't. It's it is a it is a load of a uh, lot of BS. The fact I'm just that looking doing at the that. Mercedes on the grid today when they were talking about it, and you just you can see close up just how much of it is bare carbon. The Petronas mm -hmm. logo is just basically transfer stuck onto bare carbon. The car's not black; it's just bare. Yeah, and mm. that's you know, and the thing is, the regulations are there to say they can do it. Mm -hmm. Props to Aston Martin; they're not doing it. Not certainly not to the same degree as everyone else. Mm. And they still got one of the best cars on the grid. And Red Bull yeah. as well. The best two cars on the grid have got more paint on them. <laughs> <laughs> Irony. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, Leom's also commented. I think you're quite a regular. But you, it rings a bell, the name. I think you're quite a regular commenter on the uh, on the live chat. He's put, Mercedes, um, Mercedes have to change the concept. Uh, the fact that zero teams copy anything from them says plenty. This will drop them back nine to 12 months in R&D. Safe to say Hamilton's career is now over. He'll never win an eighth, <laughs> never win an eighth championship. The king is dead. Long live the king. Um, I think you're making some big assumptions there. I, I do see what you mean about the side pods, though. I think they, I think it's pretty obvious that it's not really working. Um, working last year and they... They got it to work for one round last year out of 22. And that's because it's probably one of their best circuits anyway. And uh, that was a bad concept. They didn't decide to get away from said bad concept. And now you're, for whatever reason, because it is uh, flyaway races, you decided to continue with it. But I, they were already hedging out there and putting it in the ether that they were going to change the side pods anyway. So mm. my question is, will it be for Saudi or will it be for, for Melbourne? That's why any time I've talked about Mercedes, I've said, I'm not going to look at what they do this first two races. I'm going to look at whenever they decide to put this new side pod concept on the car. And then I'll start, um, you know, to make my assumptions accordingly about this car. Now, I've also, they also talked about the fact that because of raising the ride height, which was literally because Mercedes' car was going to go and make both George and Lewis unable to walk, um, mm. the, then they, the, that's a problem now. So I'm like, okay, how the heck do you have all these people? You have the biggest, one of the biggest, if not the biggest team outside of like Ferrari, you have all this money. I mean, I get it. There's some limitations and restrictions, but how can you miss with 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 this this badly for like two years in a row? And I honestly go back to 21 when Red Bull with Fish Lips was well ahead and they needed an engine upgrade to freaking go and give them give Lewis a chance. Um, I mean, yes, they kind of went back and forth, but then in the summer from Monaco through the whole entire summer, it was all for stopping. And he gained that advantage, ran over Lewis a couple times, and then held the advantage. It took, I mean, that's the thing. I, I think three years in a row, they've messed up with this car. In the last two years, it's been pretty obvious, or at least last year it was obvious, and early this year it's obvious. And I think it's, a, a, I, I wonder, what what is Toto doing other than just, sitting there and voguing, whatever the hell he does, talking, acting like he's Arnold Schwarzenegger or whatever. I mean, like, go and, go and effing do something. I think it goes back to 2020, in my opinion, because you've yeah. got um, 2020, they were they were incredibly dominant, uh, obviously because Ferrari were just completely, completely, um, you know, um, handicapped for the for the season because of their engine penalty. And, um, oh, sorry, alleged engine penalty, I beg your pardon. And... Um, they switched off development so early in that season because they had the thing wrapped up and then they didn't develop much in 21 either because they're prepping for 22. And then when they did, they produced this thing. Yeah. And it's, and then they've gone back the following year and they've done the same thing again. They haven't done a good development since 2020. Yeah. And mm. I think there's a lot of brain drain in that, in that team. There's a lot of, a lot of big names have gone out of that team in the last mm. few years. You know, mm -hmm. James Allison moved to another position, and then you've you lost um, uh, Andy Cowell oh, from the engine department, and then you know James Vowles has gone to Williams. It's not you know there's, there was always reports of different people leaving for Aston Martin and leaving for Red Bull powertrains, and there's been a huge amount of brain drain in that team. And I do think that they're not as slick as as they used to be, and they're certainly not as innovative. 
they they had a huge advantage with the engine in in 14 15 16 but to their credit they let their drivers race so we still had championships that were fun to watch but since then it's been it, the, the engine was you know gradually sort of coming back in honda and ferrari caught up and since then yes basically since 2020 they've not been as slick operationally and the cars have not been advanced there's not really advanced that much since 2020 in my opinion, and so I think needed... I think they they may well be over the hill and far away. And they needed Lewis to do Lewis things to basically cover for them. And then yeah. last year, when they didn't provide a car that was functional, they're asking Lewis to fix it. And George was going out there, and because he's driven turds his whole career in Formula One, he's like, "All right, I'll drive and get top fives. And that's what he did all of last year. So. It's it's just on. I, I find it to be uh, very questionable, and I do agree, Tom, with your assessment. I mean, it goes back that far, and I I've been I said it on my show probably too, that it's like where what is the deal? You know, you have one of the greatest drivers ever lived, and you have your future sitting right there. What are you trying to do? You know, you're letting all these people go left and right, whatever, but you don't have answers. Somebody has to answer for this. Because eventually, if they decide to pull the plug, what's going to happen? You know, like, obviously, they're committed until, I don't know, 2030. So they're not going anywhere anytime soon. Now, how good they're going to be between now and 2030 is arguable is a, something to discuss. But. Makes you think, doesn't it, with some big, big manufacturers like uh, Cadillac and Andretti, Audi coming in, they may kind of get turfed out. And it's. <laughs> Very early days, I don't see them doing that anytime soon. Like you said, 2030 or whatever's um, you know, what the contract are to, but who knows? Who knows what this might trigger? Well, you know, if you'd have said to somebody in the mid-90s that the likes of Williams and McLaren will still be in F1 in 30 years' time, but they'll be at the back of the grid and really struggling, no one would have believed you. So that all things come to an end with Formula One. The the development's relentless. You know, you can pump as much money as you want in there, and that'll probably help, but not necessarily. Yeah, you look at where Matisic bought the Jaguar, and that team was pretty much god awful. Mm. And they bought Minardi, and they were god awful. And then, yes, they found a guy from BMW, a BMW junior driver who ended up being one of the greats of all time and won Seb Vettel. And mm. uh, and then you that they benefited from a rules package change. Then once that rules change happened, they fell back. And essentially, you look at it, after 13, Red Bull, outside of Daniel Ricciardo, for like making his in 14, outside of that, they were not really a factor until 21. I mean, mm. yes, they were up there. Yes, they could win races here and there. You know, fish lips became a thing, but it took them what seven? It took them seven, eight years to come back. Mm. You know, uh, so I mean, that's where Formula One kind of goes, and it's crazy to think, but it, it's the same way as what you're talking about. Like Williams has went from being the best team in Formula One when I started watching the sport thirty years ago, <laughs> and now they're the worst, yeah, arguably the worst. McLaren was a team that Ayrton Senna drove for, and he went to Williams. And now McLaren, in theory right now, are in a very bad position. You know, like, it's crazy. Um, and, it's, and then, you know, the team that used to, whatever, however many iterations it's been, the Endstone team, and they've changed, I don't know how many different times since then, and now they're a midfield team. Kind of mm. where they were when they first started. You know, like, it's interesting to go and look back now once you start thinking about mm. every one of these teams and where they came from. I mean, essentially, Mercedes was BAR. So. Tyrrell. <laughs> Tyrrell, yeah. Yeah. Crazy to think. Crazy to think. Well, anyway, lads, I need to skedaddle. It's been great yeah. talking to you. Really enjoyed today's show. And thanks to everybody who's listened and commented on the live stream. Really do appreciate your input. 